Next, our keynote speaker is Ty Cobb. He's been around for a while. He was a national security advisor to President Reagan. I probably said it wrong. What was it, Ty? My boss. I work. Okay, you work for the national security advisor. He knows a hell of a lot about national security. Without any further ado, Ty Cobb. Who is this guy, Vladimir Putin, and who is the leader of Russia at this time? What do you know about him? Anything? KGB. What else? Well, let's take a look. Here's some important. What's that? Oh, well, he'd like. Oh, we're going to show you something in just a minute. Ah. Uh, uh, Putin was a former uh, colonel in the uh, state security apparatus, Komichev, Gasovodarsvanoi, Biazapasnosti, or the KGB. And he grew up at a time, and he was in the KGB when he saw the Soviet Union that he had dedicated his life to disintegrate. And this, what he saw happening was the disintegration into a uh, lack of pariyadak, which is order. And this has always been so important. And seeing Moscow losing global respect in the sense that what was the great Soviet Union of the peer competitor of the United States had been diminished in stature and was now, after 1991, only a shadow of its own existence as Russia and not the Soviet Union. And there's a sense that the Western countries led by the United States and NATO were taking advantages of Russian Slavnos weakness. Remember, uh, who was it, Jill Tulse, that said Russia was weak and it will be punished? Stalin, right. In 1931, Russia is backward, Stalinos, and because of our Stalinos, our backwardness, we are weak, Slavnost, and we must overcome that. And there's always been that sense. Now, there's an interesting twist because this is and had been in the Soviet Union a communist society. It is no longer pledges allegiance to Marx or to something, the international doctrine called communism. In fact, Putin is a throwback to the Russian emperors which were at one time both head of the Russian Orthodox Church as well as the head of the state. Putin is not anti-God. He is reclaiming the old theme from Tsarist Russia, autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationalism. And you, we, somebody had made the joke that Russia, and Putin loves to uh, present himself as this macho guy, super bad. And you remember the famous comment from President George W. Bush. She said, I looked into Putin's soul, and he saw something that most other people uh, hadn't. I'm not sure that the president would still say that. But that relationship that had begun to develop in a positive way under former President George W. Bush took a severe downturn with Obama and in his eight years in office. And Russian-American relations continued uh, to de de deteriorate. So who is this Russian guy? I heard that. You like that. He likes to be seen as this manly guy, goes off into Siberia like this, shirtless, and, and rides on his horseback. This is the image that he's tried to create. I think a lot of it's true, and also about a country that is something to be respected that in the last 15 years in his mind has not been respected. Let's take a look <clears throat> at Russia. Remember at one time, all of this area, including Kazakhstan and the five stands in the central states and these countries near the Caspian Sea like uh, Georgia and, and Azerbaijan, were all part of the Soviet Union. 
And if we were to look up there by St. Petersburg, there were countries in the Baltic areas, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they were all part of the Soviet Union. But today, this entity has been greatly reduced in size. It's still the largest country in the world by far. What have we seen in uh, Putin? Well, as I mentioned, this no longer is a communist society. In fact, he likes those themes from the czarist days, like he was Nicholas I. Uh, he has embraced the church. He embraces the, the concept that the Russian rulers of the 19th century lived by, autocracy. And we have noticed it during the reign of Vladimir Putin, there's been a steady disintegration of the rights of the individual in favor of the state. Those people that were dissidents and that had outlets have been largely diminished. A judicial system that now bows to Putin's whims. Here's the interesting thing. Is there a large dissatisfaction with this? No. Nope. Most Russians are content with this loss of freedom because of everything that's going around them. They're worried about the sense that Russia itself is being diminished by the United States. It's being diminished by this influx of foreigners. It's being diminished by the surge of population in the Muslim uh, areas. And they somehow believe that the United States under Obama, and maybe at some point Trump, has orchestrated all of this. Here's some surprising things I think that you wouldn't know. Dem de demography in Russia. The population, what's the birth rate among Russians today? Anybody want to make a guess? 1.6. Replacement rate is 2.1. Russians are not replacing themselves. They're a dying race. By the end of the century, <clears throat> they may essentially die out. Population among the Russians is gradually declining. It's, it's every family has one child and that's it, not 2.1, which is needed just to maintain the population. Uh, we're also seeing that in addition to fertility rates, male life expectancy has drastically declined. Why is that? A lot of uh, alcohol very poor alcohol, poor living conditions, lots of medical thing, widespread abortion, high use of alcohol. So we're seeing severe challenges to this thing that was called the Russian race. But if that was the birth rate in Russia, what is going on in the Muslim area? Where are the, where are the Muslim areas of Russia? Huh? And in the area around the Caspian Sea, the Muslim areas of Georgia, which is not necessarily Muslim, but Azerbaijan, Dagestan. Remember Dagestan? That's where the Sarnaev brothers were from that committed the atrocity in Boston. In these, and then in Central Asia, that part that's still part of Russia, that's where the birth rate is going. In just a few years, Russia still has a draft for the armed forces. The cohort of 18-year-olds coming into the armed services that are eligible for the draft, by the end of the century, is going to be a majority Muslim. Or the, I mean, in, in the next few years. And by the end of the century, the, the majority population, think of this, the majority population in Russia may very well be over 50% Muslim. Now, I have to make a, most of the Russians are, are not secular, they're not violent, they're not uh, secular, but still, that remains an important factor. The demographics are rapidly changing. Another important aspect that you may not realize is how rapidly the Russian economic growth has slowed. Under Putin, this was his most significant achievement. Russia was achieving, early on in his reign, fantastic and impressive growth rates. Why was that? What's the primary reason? 
specifically, you're right, but why? What about oil? Exports. When the price of oil, remember, at one time was $120 a barrel, then it dropped to $90 a barrel. Russia is still one of the major exporting countries of raw crude oil. And when the price of oil was at $120 or $90, they were swimming in hard currency. What's the price of oil today? Maybe $18 a barrel. Russia cannot produce oil at that price because the easy to get at oil that was in the western areas in the Volga Basin is no longer there. They've had to go deep into Siberia. And in order to do that, they need Western American technology. So this is the single most important factor. Remember, Russia remains today essentially a banana republic. What does that mean? What is the banana republic defined by? It's like Guatemala, Honduras. They have one export, bananas. And that was their whole economy. Russia has one thing going for it, export of natural gas and oil. And with the rapid decline of prices, if you're a banana republic like that, you suffer. So when in 2008, their growth dropped so that in the last couple of years, it's been 1.4% and less. So there's a, a crying need within Russia for market-based solutions, but I don't see that this is a society that is ready for a transformation to the modern era. They remain dependent so much on the export of natural resources whose prices are extraordinarily low. <clears throat> we'll just look at this for a minute. But look at their gross domestic product, how, how it began to decline around 2008 and then in 2010. And this is very commensurate. This drop is with the price of oil and natural gas. And a little more specific, taking this up to date to the last two years, 2015 and 2016, look what has happened to the annual growth rate in Russia in the economy. It has declined from even a mediocre 2.1% back in the 2013 to last year minus 3.8%. Severe economic problems impacting that company. Well, what hasn't been impacted up until the present time has been spending on the military. This is the one thing that gives Russian credibility and prestige in the world. They're modernizing their armed forces. Their military spending has gone up. But I don't see how any way in hell that they can continue this emphasis on the military and the continual rise when there are so many crying needs in, in the economy. So what does this guy Putin want? Well, we're all familiar in the Crimean Peninsula, which, by the way, even though it has a degree of independence, was historically part of Russia. This Sevastopol, there was a famous naval base there. And this is in the Crimea. And Russia undertook some covert actions to set up the Crimea for annexation. And there was a vote where supposedly, and I don't think anybody believed it, 95% voted in favor of reunification with Russia. Russia doesn't have a land bridge to that Crimean Peninsula into the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, maybe a slight majority are Russian, but 22% are Sunni Muslim and Tatars. So it's just, there's an extreme price that they paid for maintaining what used to be part of the great Russian empire the Crimea. Well, in reaction to the Crimean takeover a few years ago, this began the imposition of sanctions on Russia, which continue to today for different reasons. We kicked Russia out of the international uh, G8 group. Uh, we imposed the initial uh, severe uh, uh, san uh, uh, sanctions. Uh, even though there's been disagreement among the allies about whether or not we continue to sanction Russia for different forms of behavior, these sanctions still persist. And this is probably one reason why Russia badly wanted somebody other than Obama or his designated successor, Hillary, uh, in office. 
let's take a look quickly here at the old Russian or Soviet empire. Remember, at the time, all of this area, the stands, like Kazakhstan, was part of Russia. Now, they're, they're all five of the stands, Uzbekistan uh, 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 and Kazakhstan and the other entities, Tajikistan, are all independent. But look at the percentage of population in those countries that are Russian, 40%, almost across the board. So if you're running the, these countries like Kazakhstan, as big as it is, you always got to be looking over at your shoulder because there is a sizable Russian minority there whose loyalty you suspect. And even in, look at this area. This is the hot debated area now of eastern Ukraine, the Dnieper River area. And Ukraine is a, a faltering government under a right-wing uh, leadership. Uh, but they are unable to control the eastern parts of Ukraine, which have historically had strong ties to Russia. Look at that, 75% Russian in some of those areas, ethnic Russian. So you can see there is a ready internal group to promote succession from Ukraine, and the Russians are threatening in these areas. We don't have any uh, alliances with Ukraine that are good, would make us want to go in there. And also, even into the Baltic countries, you still see sizable Russian minorities. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, <clears throat> Ukraine. This is Ukraine. U Ukraine is defined by one thing, the river Dnieper. It flows down this way. If you're a right bank Ukrainian, that means you're on the left side here, and you're probably 100% Ukrainian and committed to the government in Kiev. But if you're on the left bank in Dnipropetrovsk, the former industrial areas, your allegiance to this thing called Ukraine is probably very suspect. And also, and let me just point out that as you go down in parts of Ukraine to the Crimean Peninsula, old part of Ukraine, and this is the Sevastopol, the, the naval base on the Mediterranean or on the Black Sea that gives you access to the Mediterranean. Um, Again, this is those areas. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, by and large, I would say Ukraine is approaching the status of being a failed state. It can barely support itself. It depends on foreign assistance. It needs bailouts. It needs energy from the Soviet Union or from Russia in the form of the gas. It needs an aid package from different countries. The U.S. is properly in NATO concerned because of the corruption of the, the current Ukraine government. So, as I move forward here, and, and we start thinking about, to what extent does the U.S. depend or have a dependence on Russia and it has leverage? And what expect, to what extent does Russia have some influence over U.S. policy? Well, to put it bluntly, Russia has very little to offer the United States and has very little leverage at the present time. What Russia does is largely unimportant to the United States, except that it can be a terrible irritant and not a help in areas like the Middle East where it intervenes on behalf of the Assad government uh, in, in Syria. It has made threatening moves in the last week against certain Baltic states, which, by the way, are members of NATO. And this presents a very serious threat at the present time. They are not helpful with respect to Iran, and in fact, have been aligned with Iran and the Shia aspect of the Muslim religion. In the past, they've been very careful, but we have to be concerned about what they're doing. Again. The bottom line is Russia offers very little in the way of ability to assist us, even in North Korea, but it can be an irritant, and I think Putin is going to play that to his strength. We have imposed sanctions uh, over the years, and we still do, on Russia. 
So the question comes up, if we're dissatisfied with what is going on in this place called Russia, what leverage do we have? Well, Russia still has leverage in the sense that it provides badly needed energy supplies primarily to Western Europe. Western Europe remains, despite other uh, means that we've taken, like different pipelines, heavily dependent on raw materials from the Soviet Union, and we're speaking primarily of natural gas and oil. But it's a two-way street. If Russia were to use that leverage to try to impose penalties or change behavior of the NATO states, it is in danger of losing the one source of hard currency that it has, its oil and gas exports. And in this day and age of rapidly declining uh, energy prices and fracking has brought about new sources of these materials, the leverage that uh, Russia has over Europe and, and North America has been uh, diminished. But nonetheless, we still have imposed sanctions on Russia for its behavior and probably will continue to do so. So I've gone through this pretty fast, but what are the major conclusions that I would leave you with? And we can talk about Russia or other aspects. The economy in Russia is in very desperate straits. And that's primarily because it's a banana republic. It remains so dependent on the export of oil and gas whose prices are going down. The second biggest concern, if I were Putin, is that I, Putin, as a Russian, are part of a dying race. We are not replacing individuals. We are disappearing. I may be overstating that, but only a little bit. The rapid demographic changes, the rise in population is almost all occurring in the Muslim areas of this entity called Russia. We're seeing more authoritarian moves by Putin to stop a dissent, and we're seeing aggressive moves rather than being helpful in areas as uh, to Syria, the Crimea, Ukraine, the Baltic states, and to a lesser extent in the Pacific area. So I'm saying in some, this guy Putin will continue to be a challenge and not a particularly helpful individual with the U.S. policy going forward. Thank you. We he, move, know, we he, knows that pretty fast. he knows this stuff. A lot of information. Now we're going to take questions about Korea, North Korea, Russia, whatever. He'll handle them. One at a time. Wait a minute, Jenny. What would I do about North Korea? Wait a minute. You got to stand up, state your name. I think I... I, think I, and I just belt out he, the question. he said... Bruce what, Seidel. What, what would I do about Bangladesh, right? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> that too. Oh. Bruce Seidel. Uh, North. The, the question was, uh, what would I do about um, North Korea? North Korea, under Kim Jong-un, continues on a path that is extraordinarily destabilizing for the region in the area and increasingly threatening to the United States. Over the years, what we have done is impose sanctions, economic sanctions primarily, that have been uh, observed by our allies like Japan, but less so by other major powers in the area like Russia and China. More recently, Russia and China have been alarmed by the rapid nuclear advances and missile capability by Pyongyang and have joined us in imposing sanctions on North Korea. Still, China remains the key. The question for me is, what would I do about North Korea if I were President Trump? We have tried what we call strategic patience for a number of years, but patience is running out. North Korea is rapidly coming to the <clears throat> position where we have the capability of delivering a missile with a nuclear warhead at least to the Western United States, in addition to areas like Guam and Hawaii, as well as neighboring states like Japan. We have said that this is not permissible. We have imposed sanctions. We have used strategic patience. 
I would believe that the administration of President Trump right now is seriously considering what military actions it could take against this rogue regime. President Trump this morning said that he would bring efforts that would destroy North Korea. I think this was maybe not artfully stated. I would have said, we have measures in hand that will remove this torturous regime that is exercising rule over North Korea. I would be very surprised if the United States at this moment was not seriously considering, not seriously considering initiating preemptive military strikes that might even be nuclear against the North. And as it does that, it takes full consideration of the horrible catastrophic implications of that, which would mean tremendous, tremendous refugee flows into nearby China, perhaps Russia, and certainly into South Korea. It would mean that the vast military machine of the North, which has thousands of artillery pieces trained on the South, would virtually destroy Seoul and maybe would send their conventional forces in to occupy the northern part of South Korea. There are no good options. They're all messy. But we're rapidly reaching the point where we probably have General Mattis, Secretary Tillerson, General McMaster have given the president options that he may have to implement. Questions? Rob. Hopefully on Russia. <laughs> yeah, what, what were the aggressive actions that Putin's taken against the Baltic states recently? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the uh, area that we're talking about um, is the Baltic states of uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania near their old capital, St. Petersburg. They have moved naval forces into the Baltic Sea, and they have moved uh, army divisions up closer to the area of contact, if you will, surrounding the area of the Baltic states. They are right at this time conducting a major exercise called Zapad, or, which means West, in which we are very concerned that the mobilization of so many Russian military forces along the Baltic states border, as well as down with, uh, in alliance with Belarusia, down into the Ukraine uh, area. So right now we're watching this exercise unfold with some suspicion that it might be designed to roll out into an actual invasion of these areas. I don't think that's going to happen, but people in Washington right now are seriously looking at where this exercise op it goes. Good question. Any more, ma'am? This is just a, a question regarding Putin and Trump. Do you think that uh, Mr. Putin has a respect or uh, of some sort with Mr. Trump where he did not with Mr. Obama? Or I don't think he did. I, I think that's a very good uh, question. And, and whether or not, what is um, President Putin's stance toward uh, the Obama and administration and Secretary of State Clinton, who was a candidate for president, and what does he think of Trump? Here's what we know for sure. We know that Russian intelligence operations intervened or attempted to intervene, I don't think very successfully, in the American elections last year to try to assist the election of Donald Trump. I don't think they were very effective, but it was, it was clear that if Putin had a choice it would be anybody but Hillary Clinton. Their, their relationship was when she was Secretary of State had deteriorated so badly. I think what the Russians did, as little as I know, and, and Mr. Mueller 
will, will tell us more when he finishes his investigation, is that the Russian attempts to influence were clumsy and not particularly uh, effective. But at that time, they clearly thought Trump would be a better choice. If I were Putin today, I would probably say, God, I'm not so sure. Uh, there's, there's very little that Trump has done as president that would make Putin very happy, including the continuation of the sanctions and the twist armings of Russia to help us in the battle against North Korea. But it, I, I don't think their in, in, intervention really had much impact. That's my sense. Uh, Mubashir Ahmed, uh, I would like to know what is Russia doing right now in Afghanistan since we, oh. you know, when we were in Afghanistan, we basically made them bankrupt uh, as far as Southeast Asia, Pakistan, India, and obviously Syria, uh, Iran, and Iraq. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, could, could I just uh, finish up by midnight? Let, on Afghanistan, let's, let's just remember that the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in the 1980s, and for that, we in the Reagan administration imposed sanctions, including boycotting the Olympics, because of their invasion in Afghanistan. They were not very successful in influencing the course of events in that country, and finally withdrew. But they've always had... Afghanistan has always been sort of the, an important lodestar. It was the romantic East, what they called the East. But I think Russian influence in the course of events in Afghanistan at the present time is extraordinarily limited. Russia has always tried to influence actions in this area through its longtime ally, India. But the uh, Moscow-New Delhi relationship has not been very strong. Uh, of late. So Russia in that area is not a major player. It has far too many other issues. It can be an irritant, but it is not a major factor. In the Middle East, however, they are trying to establish a beachhead with Syria and President Assad. That's their lone star. They have a naval base in Latakia on the Mediterranean coast part of Syria. It's, I mean, it's maybe 12 people. It's not much of a base, but it's a base. And they are trying to be, con continue to be a player in affairs in the Middle East. And they primarily do this by being irritant to us and supporting uh, the Shia uh, government, uh, Shia entities and, and uh, Syria as a country. Hi. <laughs> I'm curious if Putin has an heir apparent, or if we're if he's the leader for the foreseeable future. Um, that's a really good question. In most entities, they really do bring up uh, individuals, but in almost every case, those people that we identified in the past as being potential leadership caliber to follow Putin are no longer in existence. He has done his very best to ensure that if the population, as it is, becomes tired of him and wants change, that there really is no alternative. So those individuals like Nimsov in Leningrad have largely been eliminated or they've been exiled. There is no powerful, charismatic figure to challenge Putin and Putin has not selected anybody that would logically be his successor to power. So it's, uh, as Louis XIV famously said, après moi, les deluge, after me, the torrent, the, the, the deluge. I think Putin is just saying, you may not like what you got, but you're sure as hell not going to like what's going to happen if I go. It's going to be chaos. Hey, Dr. Cobb? Yes. Um, uh -oh. Do you think Putin has, not, Putin has really not cut off his exports to North Korea as far as oil and coal is concerned? So do you think that Putin is trying to get us into a, a little conflict with North Korea, maybe a shooting war, so that we, it takes our attention off the Baltic stake so he can move in there while our attention is in North yeah, Korea? That's a good question, Jim. Um, I don't think so. If I'm Putin and I ha I'm uh, playing from a fairly weak hand, especially with respect to North Korea, I say this North Korean regime is floundering. 
It has support from China and Beijing. That's it. I can go in and play some kind of a role and assist. But the aid from Russia in terms of the fuel supplies has been fairly minor. It's really the key to changing North Korean behavior really lies in Beijing, not Moscow. Russia is a minor player in this conflict. Uh-oh, Frank. What is your definition of a failed state, and how close is Russia to a failed state? No, that's a very good question. I would say the key definition of a failed state is when the economy is no longer able to produce the goods and services that the population needs to exist, there, thereby <coughs> turning into discontent. Second aspect of that, <clears throat> when you are no longer able to play a role on the world stage, uh, commensurate with your <clears throat> demographics and your uh, economic power. Russia falls into that. The third category, though, I have not seen. Normally in a failed state, the government disintegrates, there's a coup. I see no prospect at this time that the Putin government is in any danger of falling, nor do I see in any sort of internal opposition to Putin that has any chance of overturning it. So two of the three definitions of a failed state, they are approaching, but the most critical one so far I've not seen, Frank. Uh, Bob Erickson, uh, if the U.S. were to attack North Korea, do you expect that China would intervene as they did in the previous conflict, or do you think they'd stay in, out? In Korea? Yes. Uh, that's an, a very important point because you recall uh, when MacArthur made the recommendation to move across the 38th parallel to the north, one of the major assumptions is that China would sit on the sidelines. Instead, China came into the Korean War 1950-51 in full strength and drove us back down before the border sort of solidified. Right now, my guess is that, and it's just that, if the United States were to launch a preemptive strike, nuclear or conventional or however, against the North, this would not cause China to intervene militarily on behalf of the North. That's my guess. But I could be wrong, and man, the, the implications of being wrong on that are pretty enormous. But I'd sure as hell like to know what General McMaster and General Mattis uh, are saying, or more importantly, out, out at Langley at the agency, because that question must have been asked. So that's my thought. I don't think they would, but if we, and we certainly are considering at this time, and I think the decision point is rapidly approaching when we have to say that what is happening in North Korea has gone past the point that we can tolerate, and therefore we need to take action, uh, sanctions, strategic patience would run their course. This means military strikes. Would they be nuclear? I think they'd have to be. And what are the radia radiation fallout impacts on South Korea and Japan, Russia and China? What are the massive refugee flows? What would happen to the North Korean Millions in uniform, would they attack the South? Probably. Um, there are no good options, but it's, it's getting to the point where even the most worrisome option might have to be undertaken. <laughs> uh -oh. I get to go twice. <laughs> so if someone was able to take and dictator out do we have any intelligence that would suggest that the military would be um, relieved uh, the people would be relieved I mean there seems to be this belief that the people are starving and you know that they're not really all that happy but I wonder if we really know that well, I couldn't tell if we know that so I can I'm gonna make a guess because that's an excellent question my guess is that we believe 
that there is no logical successor to Kim Jong-il and nobody who's lining up uh, an opposition force to take control of that country and bring it into a more stable state. Um, <clears throat> my sense is that in the case that we would exercise that preemptive strike against the regime, which we call regime change, that I think is the most logical option if we're going to do military strikes, is to eliminate the leadership of the country. But right now, all I can see is chaos. And I, the military, I don't see a four-star general who's going to come up, okay, we've lost the political leadership, we're going to stabilize the country, we're going to work with our adversaries and allies and uh, right now, Kim Jong-un has not permitted anybody to assume any role of influence. And uh, while regime change certainly has to be considered a viable option, I don't think that there is any logical successor that can assume control of that country. It would be total chaos. I have uh, one more question. Do you not think that China, which has a lot more to lose, that if we attack North Korea and they have a lot of trade to lose, etc., do you not think that China is going to take some action in the near future? That's my hope. I have not seen anything to justify my hope. I can't understand, and if I were Secretary Tillerson talking to the leadership in Beijing, I would say, for God's sakes, you of all people understand what a rogue regime this is and where they're going and it's going to be catastrophe on the peninsula and that will spill over to china only you have the influence to change the behavior of pyongyang whether you do that through economic persuasion arm twisting or military intervention but you better do it because the alternative is going to be very bad You have one? You, you don't get one, Ray. <laughs> yeah, Ray, make sure you have the microphone. What do you think really is going to happen in the Baltics and Crimea with, with Putin? You know, it's a power play, a lot of Russian oriented people, language. What do you think is really well, going to happen? Ray wants to know what I think is going to happen both in the Crimea area, <clears throat> which I think is over, um, and in the Baltics. I think for all intents and purposes, Russia has control of the uh, Crimea area and Ukraine no longer exercises any. But let's face it, although Crimea is an extension on land of Ukraine, was never part of the Ukrainian state. It was always an important Russian naval base and, and area. I think as much as we disagree and we have imposed sanctions for their es essential occupation of Crimea, it is historically a Russian area. And I don't see that, Ray, as a, as a lightning rod. The Baltic states are quite different. You know, they left the Soviet Union. Eventually, they all three joined NATO. And now Russia is conducting a gigantic military exercise called Zapad West. And it, they're moving very close to the border here that we've thought because maybe they feel the American leadership is preoccupied that they can simply move in. Why would they do it when they're such a weakened state in terms of the economy and the demographic changes and even in the military? Well, Maybe if you're going down, what the hell? So I, I remain very concerned about the Russian military exercise. I would watch it very closely this week. But I still can't believe that Putin would actually take military action against a NATO country. Politician uh -oh. always has a question. This will be the last one, so we can... Well, we got Jill and one other. Oh, okay, the last two, Ray says. See, I follow orders. I just thought that Dennis Rodman was going to settle all this. Oh, right, so I was right. just curious to know what role you think he's going to play. Well, you know, when I saw that uh, 
Jill Tolls and Dennis Rodman were going to go to Korea together too. So, you know, I got to tell you, Jill, there are crazy things going on in the world. And if Dennis Rodman wants to go to North Korea and try to do citizen diplomacy, I'd say, fine, go do it. You know, nothing else has worked. Dennis, maybe you're crazy enough to make it happen. One, one more question. Yes, sir, Gary Nielsen. I just uh, wonder if um, I've heard, I don't know if they're rumors or not, but a uh, partnership between the United States and Canada to build a rather large LNG port on the East Coast to supply natural gas to Europe would seriously hurt the economy of the Soviet of Russia and therefore kind of restrain its um, aggressiveness in the Baltics. I think that's a very good point. What he wanted to know is there being consideration, um, can I expand the question of building uh, LNG, uh, liquefied, liquefied natural gas export terminals that would ship uh, this raw material energy source to Europe to further diminish, to actually to bring hard currency, but also would diminish Russian influence. You know, for those of us that, I wrote my dissertation on energy, Soviet energy, and just remember, it was only about 12 years ago we were all saying, we're in deep crap, you know, the, uh, the price, the, the availability of oil and natural gas is going down, the price is going to go up, we're going to be dependent on imports from Venezuela or the Middle East, uh, or even exporting places like Russia, and suddenly, we have expanded our capability of producing oil and LNG, largely because of fracking, but other means of detecting deep deposits. So that now, rather than being this major importer of these raw materials, we are actually in the business of exporting energy to foreign countries. And one of the most important ways we do that is by liquefying natural gas at the terminals and then shipping that worldwide that undercuts the prices that other countries can do. I fully expect right now mo most of the LNG <clears throat> export terminals in Louisiana and the Caribbean in that area, I fully expect that there will be an agreement, a North American energy agreement, whereby the vast supplies of gas and oil that Canada has, principally in Alberta, Saskatchewan, will be piped to the export terminals. And I would not be surprised, although I've not heard it specifically, to see a major LNG uh, terminal built on the East Coast to export to Europe. But watch for that. One more question. Uh, way off. Yeah, I'm way off. How is Russia dealing with the, uh, the refugees from other countries? Do they accept them in? Well, you know, the, the question, well, yeah, there aren't too many California. sanctuary cities in uh, Russia. Um, that's a very good question because the massive refugee flows that have come out of the conflicts in Africa and in, in the Middle East have created enormous floods of uh, individuals that have come into Western Europe, less so the United States uh, to date. Um, but countries have had to deal with this sudden influx of refugees who have no means of supporting themselves and may have been infected by Islamic is, Islamist fervor. And we do know that many of these refugees, it's, the numbers are not as significant as West Europe, have wound up into the Muslim areas of Russia, not so much Moscow or St. Petersburg, but into the uh, <clears throat> Caucasus, for example, and Central Asia. And uh, they've been a destabilizing force that Russia has to worry about. So far, this illegal or refugee incursion into Russia has not been a significant problem that they had to deal with. But given demographic changes, it's going to be a major issue, no doubt. So let me just thank everybody for this opportunity to talk. Thank you. What, what knowledge he has of foreign affairs. Great job.
Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead, and if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail. Go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. And go over here, watch a couple more videos. Link to our website at republicanmenisclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.